Join us, friends. Great Scott Swagai. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, Swagai? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Swagai, and it is... Globes riding with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that a lot of people are. So in this episode, Trey thought it would be interesting to talk about what it was like growing up in the 70s and 80s. And I actually grew up partially in the 60s, all of the 70s, all of the 80s. I was grown. uh, I graduated high school in 1983. Okay. So I would say that 80s would be the greatest decade known to man, just as <laughs> just as a general rule. Now, some people would argue with that. I think the 50s were a great decade. The 60s were kind of a little bit hippie for me decade. The 70s were very Elvis and happy days. Happy Elvis and happy days. But, you know, the reality is, is Happy Days uh, would have been late 70s. Um, so I have a lot of, you even asked me, you know, do, do you remember early 70s? Yeah, of course I remember the early 70s. So we're just going to have a discussion about I re- what I can remember from the 70s and 80s and uh, how things were different then than they are now would be one one comparison and uh but i have very vivid memories of a lot of that kind of stuff so you have specific questions we can Uh, start there okay like so right now without really thinking about it what stands out most about the 70s to you um uh, of course being in school during that time you know i started in the first grade in 70 Oh, 1970. And, um, Spy guys in the first grade in 19. I'm in the first grade in 1970. <laughs> Elvis and, was uh, selling out the Houston Astrodome. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, um, you know, Elvis was always a part of, you know, if we'll go there first really quickly. My, I don't ever remember having Elvis records as far as my parents listening to Elvis and that kind of stuff. But somehow I always knew who Elvis was. So as a kid, we would sing Hound Dog. We would go, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. You know, like he was screaming it. And that was just, and we knew to shake our leg and we just knew it. It It's just part of the fabric of, of uh, Americana. Americana. Yeah. And, and I think some people that listen to this will take issue with that because I think it was probably worldwide. You know, we think everything is is down to the little bubble that we consider our our life in the United States. But the reality is, is Elvis was worldwide. So I'm sure that there was kids doing the same thing I was doing over in Europe and in Asia and in Africa. And if that you was know, you, make sure you comment below and let us know because we like Yeah, it. absolutely. I think that's very interesting. Did Was that a part of your household as a child growing up? I was born in 1965. So I have a few recollections in, in the late sixties, I have a lot of recollections from the seventies on one would be, um, something that really stands out talking about the first grade. I went to Sadie Soller elementary in Greenville, North Carolina. Um, we had lived in Richmond, Virginia for a very short, short time. You and I went and filmed there. Remember we found to tell you about my recollections. Remember in that video, I had a memory of a spiral staircase that went down in a park to the James river. And me and you actually went and found that the last time I saw that staircase was over was 50 years. Oh, well, I think it was 49 years and some change prior to when, no, it would have, no, it would have been longer than that. It was, it was over 50 years. The last time I would have been there. That's right. Because uh, that was only like a year ago, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I just have a recollection of, I can see that spiral staircase going down into that park. And uh, that story goes, you know, well, let, let's start. You remember the Richmond, Virginia story? The Richmond, Virginia? You remember yeah, the story uh, I told it about was, my dad? Yeah, it was like an event that the, this town was having where they had hidden something somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right. It and, was, uh, was a radio show. 
in Richmond that, uh, and I've got, we've got friends that live in Virginia and I've actually talked to him. Uh, he's going to be on a, um, a podcast soon, uh, him and her and, uh, him and his wife. And, and we've actually spoken about this particular thing. And what it was, was it was a local radio station that was doing, a giveaway and they were sponsored by a camper place, a place that sold motorhomes. And what they were doing was they basically sent these clues around this park. And if you could get them, you'd win this sum of money. I have, I have no recollection of the sum of money. I've even tried to go back and find newspaper articles and stuff, but there aren't any because it was a radio thing. Yeah. So um, what they were doing was they hid these clues in the, in the park in James river park. And that spiral staircase actually goes down into the James River. And um, my dad went there and hunted for those clues. I remember going with him to hunt for the clues as a, a four or five-year-old child. And he got frustrated because he could not find any clues. So he decided to make his own clues. So he got a, got a printer. Back then would have been the... So this is this is going to date me, and you probably know nothing about what I'm getting ready to tell you. But now, when you want to print something, you just hit a button, and the printer goes, could you? Right? right? So back then, the way they would have done it was, I remember my teachers doing it. We would, She would have had this thing that had, um, that had like, copy uh, the, the purple stuff where you write on it, and it goes through to the next page. Carbon copy. Like a carbon copy. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it would be that copy thing and they would write on it, whatever they wanted or, or type on it. Then you would stick it into a tumbler on a printer. Like the top of it would fit inside and it would put it on there. And every time that it would go, it would print a page. So it would actually spin that thing. And it had a very specific smell to it. When we were in school, the teacher would go make copies of something and she would bring it and it didn't pr it printed kind of almost in a light purple color. And the ink from my memory was a light purple color, but it had a very distinct smell to it. And a lot of times if they just made the copies, when she brought them back and passed them out, they would be warm. Okay. So the, the paper would actually be warm from being in the machine. Yeah. So my dad took that and what he had to do was he didn't have the ability to go and have copies made somewhere. So he actually had to, to write one and then hand copy it, make the next one, make the next one, make the next one. So, so that's, uh, that's something from the seventies. And I think by the, I think we, they were still doing that in the early eighties. Wow. It was after I was out of school from my recollection, I could be wrong that you could stick a piece of paper in it and hit a button and something came out. And, and, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's pretty accurate. Um, the other than they would have had the kind of paper in the things where it had the holes on the sides. You know yeah. how you you print it out and then you tear the things off the sides. Now that would have been a way that they could print uh, printing things. But just sticking something in a scanner, scanning it, and then just printing it like we can do today. I could literally do it in five minutes with my phone. I could take my phone and go, could you? And hit it to my printer, and it just print right out. And your dad had to spend time of his life writing <laughs> and doing them. And he went into that park and hid those clues. And he stood there and waited for people. <laughs> and they would hear him go, ah, I've got it. And they would run out of the park. They'd run and show up over at the radio station to the point where the radio station got on there and said, look, this is sponsored by this motor home place. If it does not have their logo on it, it's not real. <laughs> Don't tell me your dad went and put their logo on them. <laughs> no, he didn't. But he, but if he, if he could have, he would have. And, uh, but anyway, he ended up not winning anything, but he fouled up the thing. So anyway, That's we, cool. ended up in, <laughs> we ended up in Greenville, North Carolina. And I remember in Greenville, the place is still there. It's called the Plaza. And back then the plaza was um, open air, kind of like they're, you know, they went from the open air thing where you would have individual stores around. The plaza was very unusual, I think, because it was like uh, they had, from my memory, it was a big star grocery store. They had a roses and they had other things, but you, but they were 
they were separate boxes right. with a sidewalk where you could walk from one to the other, kind of like they've gone back to nowadays. Here in Hendersonville, where I live, they have a place called the Streets of Indian Lake. Um, they have a place over in uh, Mount Juliet that's like that. That's a bunch of stores you walk between them. My brother lives in Jacksonville, Florida, and he has a chocolate shop, a Kilwin shop, at a place called St. John's Place. And what that is is a bunch of stores, but you leave the store and walk outside to the next store. But there's tons of them around. I mean, it's you know, it's a big conglomerate of stores. Yeah, like an so outdoor, it's like that. Like Tell a, me again. Outdoor mall. Right an there. outdoor mall. And they kind of went from that to the indoor mall. And I think a lot of them are reverting back. But anyway, the place I'm talking about is actually still there. In fact, the famous YouTuber, um, Mr. Beast, he has an office just in front of, or did have an office. I think it's not there anymore. But at one point, at the, at the left corner of the mall, if you're standing on Greenville Boulevard and looking at it, I was told that he had an office on that left side right there. Um, and I remember going there as a kid. And one memory, specific memory is, uh, now you've got to keep in mind that $5 was a lot of money when the story that I'm going to tell you happened. We lived very close to the hospital in Greenville, but we would leave there and go to the plaza which now that I think back was not really very close to where we lived. Um, so I don't know why we would have specifically gone to the plaza for this particular thing, but I have a memory of um, going to the grocery store to the big star there. And I think it was a big star. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right at the plaza and to get ice cream. My dad loves ice cream, still does. And we went there to get it, and he took a $5 bill out. And, of course, as a kid, what do you want to do? You want to hold it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. somewhere between there and the grocery store, I lost it. Oh, gosh. Okay. Come on, man. <laughs> so I got my butt whooped for that. That's that's a fact. That did happen. You just dropped it somewhere and didn't think yeah, about well, it. Well, I mean, I don't know. You're a kid. You, you lose interest in things really quickly, you right. know. You probably just put it in your pocket and it, it fell out or just There's threw it. There's Plus absolutely it's no telling. You didn't want to hold the five dollars anymore. So you just said no. It. Well, I got my butt whooped on that, and of course the five dollars is gone. They don't have another five dollars to get the ice cream, so, so it didn't go well. Let's just say that. That was back when five dollars was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one memory of that particular place. Another memory that's very, very, very vivid in my mind is uh, for Christmas I wanted a banana bike because that was a big deal at the time. And what I'm talking about is a, 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 the bicycle that has the banana seat. You know, the seat's long and thin like this. And I wanted one with what they called a sissy bar. Okay, so on the back of it, instead of the bar at the bottom of the seat, you know how on a banana bike, it's just a loop. On the back of the seat, there's a loop like that. Yeah, yeah. They also had a real tall one, and it was oh. called a sissy bar. <laughs> okay. You know, so I guess so you couldn't fall off the back because you were scared. You were a sissy. Yeah. And I wanted one with a sissy bar. I wanted one with a headlight. And I also wanted one with turn signals. So back then they had this thing that you could mount to the sissy bar. And it had like an arrow that pointed both ways and a brake light in the middle. And it was battery powered and it had a headlight. Uh, the back part from my memory was battery powered, but the headlight was powered off of, and maybe all of them were powered off the same thing, but I don't think so. I think inside that thing with the arrows on it was a battery or two batteries, but, um, they had the generator that you mounted and it would run on your tire. It would actually rub the tire and it would spin. And that's what powered your headlight. Oh, okay. you ever heard of that? Never heard of it. See, hey, man, we're 70s. This is 70s all day long now. So that, <laughs> so I got for Christmas that year a uh, a yellow banana bike. I think it was a, I've gone back and looked and figured out the model. I think it was a Murray, and I'm going from memory. It could be wrong, but it was yellow with black racing stripes. It had what we call a cheater slick on the back. So instead of it having a bicycle tire, it was a slick, like a racing slick, flat on the bottom. So it was wide and flat, and it would say cheetah on it, not cheater. So cheater yeah. slick was for drag racers. That was kind of a term, C-H-E-A-T-E-R. Mm -hmm. But these would say C-H, 
E E T E R, like cheetah, or uh, yeah, yeah, like a, the animal, a cheetah, okay, right. like or a, a cat. Yeah, yeah. So it would actually say cheetah on it, slick. And on the front, you would have a smaller tire. And on some of the bicycles, I actually collect bicycles. A lot of you, if you've watched my Elvis videos where um, I proved that the bicycle that was hanging in the um, smoke house was Elvis's first bicycle, and they take it down and restore it. I talk about owning a collection of bicycles. I have 70s. I have a 67 model Sears. Uh, today, I have a 67 model Sears Spider with a three-speed stick shift. I have a 70 model Sears Spider with a three-speed stick shift. Um, and I have a Schwinn crate. But my Schwinn crate is modern day, but it has the 70s look. But what I got, my, uh, my Murray had a three-speed stick shift on it. It had the uh, the the bars that were kind of up high like that. It had the the and I don't know how my parents afforded it, but you know it because it was at the time was probably very expensive. But it came from that roses. I went to the roses and picked it out and talked about that that was the one I wanted. And Santa Claus brought that to me. So I wanted to go once I got it. I asked to go to my uncle Ed's house. Now my uncle Ed and my aunt Mildred uh, had four children. They had uh, Patricia, Eddie, Jimmy, and Scott. Scott was my age or close to my age. And they were my older cousins. And they were always, um, I always looked up to them because they were a little older than me and they seemed to be so cool. In fact, Jimmy and Eddie, I can remember being there. I would go there and stay during the summer. I would stay with my aunt and uncle, even after we moved out of Greenville. We only lived there one year. Um, and then we moved to Aiden. Um, so I would go stay with them and my cousins, Jimmy and Eddie, which are still in Greenville, North Carolina and are very successful business owners there. They did paper routes on unicycles, if you can imagine. So they actually rode unicycles and they would, because you don't, you're not steering, you could throw paper with both hands. Wow. So they did their paper routes with unicycles and I would help them roll their papers. So they would get the papers flat. What they would have to do is we'd have to roll them up, put uh, 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 rubber bands around them and pack them in their satchels that they would wear around them so they could ride the unicycle and throw the papers. That and I can crazy. remember seeing them ride the unicycles through the yard. So can you, you imagine that your paper boy is going to be riding a unicycle? That would be unique enough. I'd probably buy a paper from them just to see them come by and throw it. You know what yeah. I mean? Wish you had so, yeah, that. Do what? Wish you had film of that. Yeah, and I actually have a unicycle. I can ride not very well, but I do own a unicycle. Okay. Um, well, that's it's a right back over there. Um, in I have a, a storage room back over there behind the studio, so it's it's hanging up in there. Um, and I wanted to ride it. I just never got real good at it. I I got enough that I could ride it, but not great. These guys could stop and back up and and do all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I wanted to go, once I got my bicycle, I wanted to go to Uncle Ed's house. And the reason that I wanted to go to Uncle Ed's house was a girl that I liked lived close to Uncle Ed. I see. So, <laughs> I see you, smart guy. So I went over to Uncle Ed's house. Can you imagine that? And we're talking about first grade. You rode your bike to Uncle Ed's house to see the girl next door. No, I got my dad to take me over with the bicycle. Oh, okay. okay. I thought so, you then, so then I rode from my Uncle Ed's house to this girl's house. Her no, name was Judy didn't. K. Vincent. It was what? Judy K. Vincent was her name. Judy I have no idea what happened to Judy K. Vincent. She Thanks would be my that. age. She Thanks would be about 58 right now. So Judy <laughs> K., if you watch that, <laughs> I really liked you in the first grade. And <laughs> I wanted to show my new ride off to you. So <laughs> I had the first vehicle. And I went to Judy K. Vincent's house to show her my new bicycle. You had game now, even back then. That's the first one. I, I was working on it. So when I got there, I'll never forget her. Uh, I knocked on the door and she let me in the house. And I looked and I have, Trey, I had never seen so many Christmas presents from Santa Claus in my life. They had presents for days. Wow. Right then and there, I thought, this girl, these people are rich. <laughs> you know, because we were we were rel relatively poor. Okay, 
Yeah, yeah. And um, even though I got a bicycle, we never went without food to eat to, that I remember. My mama said that we did, but I have no recollection of that. Um, but I went there and just thought, wow, look at this stuff. She had the Barbie dream houses and, I mean, just a room full of stuff. From my memory, they had finished. They had, um, I could take you, I'd take you right now to where the house is at. It's going to be another. I, I remember exactly where it's at. In fact, it may be in, in some of the videos. I filmed in Greenville uh, some things and put it on the channel. So anyway, I go to Judy's house and I knock on her door and she lets me in and, and it seemed like they closed the garage in. So the room was really big that I could, I could still see the room. And, um, but that's just a, a, a strange recollection from being there. And I can remember doing a play in 1971 at Sadie Sauter School. Um, I, I have uh, recollections of being in that, in that little room and being on the stage and doing a play. And it was not a play play. It was where each student had one line to say or something like that. But I can remember being there at that. Now, the second grade, I we ended up living in Aiden, North Carolina, and we went to Aiden Elementary School, which I have definitely gone there and filmed and put that stuff on, probably on my weekly Spa Guy channel, where I'll go back to towns and reminisce about things that, that happened. I think I've told the Judy K. Vincent story and showed the house in one of those videos. That would be in Greenville, North Carolina. It'd be Spa Guy, Greenville, North Carolina. Um. But I can remember uh, second, I went to second, third, and fourth grade in uh, at Aiden Elementary, and a few things stick out to me there. One thing was when I was in the, I'm going to say it was the third grade, and it may have been the second grade, I was in a play where I played Goldbeard, and it was a, a play about Alaska, about the gold rush in Alaska. What the name of it was, I have no recollection of that. Um, but I remember being there and in the fourth grade, there was a kid and his name was John Bazell, black kid. And John Bazell in the fourth grade was an unbelievable artist. I've never seen anybody that, I mean, we're talking about somebody in the fourth grade. How old are you in the fourth grade? Nine years old, eight years old. Eight. Okay. So eight or nine years old, John Bazell, do you remember in the in the TV show Good Times? You remember that painting that they had in there where it was kind of exaggerated, where the people I'm gonna stand up and it was kind of exaggerated where the people were kind of um, I don't I don't know how to do it, but it was a, a type of art where the people were not proportioned; they were kind of exaggerated out, discombobulated, kind of. Yeah, but but not in a uh, not in a a, a way. Like, um, uh, what's that, what's that artist that does the things that are so where the person is, is almost disfigured is real square. Yeah. Like um, somebody's yelling at the screen right now. Um, but anyway, that's an aside. So he could draw like that painting that's on that TV show in the fourth grade. And he did this thing that always stuck out to me. And that is. When he would, he would do a lot of stuff with crayon. So after he would draw with crayon, he would take a, uh, he would take toilet paper or something of that, you know, that kind of stuff. And he would rub it and it would change the sheen of it and he could move it. Or, I mean, just unbelievable stuff. And I was in the art contest in, uh, in the fourth grade and I won second place to John Bazell. He got so, first place. Yeah. And I did, it was on a book report and I did a, um, a drawing of ships and all the different countries. So what I did was like a big ship. And then I put all the names of the different countries all around it. I ended up getting second place in that. But my second place behind John Bazell was like, John was up here and I was here. It was, and I actually ended up running into John when I worked at the Ford place in LaGrange somehow he came in there to buy a car or to get his car worked on. And it was John Bazell and he had done very well for himself. So I just have very fond memories of him. He was very, very ultra talented. And I remember asking him if he still did art and he was like, eh. but man, he should have stuck with it. Cause he was great. I wonder if he still does it. 
Uh, I hope he does. And uh, maybe I should try to reach out to John. He, he'd make a great uh, yeah. podcast uh, episode to just find out what what he has done and how, how things have gone. Yeah. Um, so something that I remember, too, from that time period, and, and I'm, I'm going to reminisce. Well, just reminisce about things, okay? And then in the middle of that, or about occasions and things that I can remember, I'm sure things will come up that are going to say 70s, okay? So there was a guy named Dwayne Elks. And Dwayne would do this thing where he would just, and, and you know, nowadays we think that, that kids in a lot of cases don't know how to act. You know, they'll act up now. Kids acted up back then too in the 70s. It was all the same. So the one it's ever, probably very, very close. Era, all this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so people are people. And uh, so Dwayne um, would do this thing when we were in the fourth grade, we were not in the building. They had done these double wide office trailers. So we were because the school had outgrown the the students had outgrown the size of the school. So we were actually in these trailers out there. And I remember Dwayne. And some of the kids would even try to egg him on to do what I'm going to tell you about. But Dwayne would do this thing where he would get this glazed over look in his eyes. And whenever that was happening, you, you kind of go, okay, here it comes. And he would start flipping desk over and just flip out. <laughs> yes. Throw desk, run around in the room and scream. I mean, just go nuts. Y'all just but whenever he did that, we all got to go to the playground. <laughs> so the kids would try to get him to do it. <laughs> and so Dwayne Elks, uh, sadly, well, I'll tell you a couple of different stories, and I'll tell you about sadly with Dwayne. Oh, heck, what did Dwayne do? <laughs> so he would do stuff like, um, I, I actually tell this in one of my videos. I tell this story. Now we're going to fast forward to the seventh and eighth grade in the same town in Aiden. Now what happened was my mother and father divorced around the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was my dad ended up remarrying and moving to Kinston. So the sixth grade, I lived with them in Kinston. Seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, I lived with my mother in Aiden again. And then 10th, 11th, and 12th, I lived back with my dad in Kinston again. So there's, but you know, that's the sad thing that my parents divorced it's never a good thing for you or your family. It messes with you. But what it does do for me is it breaks up time. So I can remember this happened at that time. And that's, I was here, you know what I'm saying? So it kind of broke it up where it helps me to remember. So we're going to bypass Kinston in the, in the sixth grade for just a moment. And we'll go to seventh and eighth grade in Aiden. So Dwayne Elks, I'm going to say this was the eighth grade. And in the eighth grade, you start filling out real fast to the point where your clothes really don't fit you anymore, but you can't afford other clothes. So, so that I can remember that happening in the eighth grade. And, um, and Dwayne, I had this necklace that I got and I had decided that I'm going to wear this necklace every day for one year. I'm not going to take it off. Okay. And um, we had at this particular uh, school, we had a wood shop where you could make things. I was make, I made a speaker. I made a cabinet for a speaker. My granddaddy got me a speaker and I made a brand new cabinet, built it, built the wood, built the cabinet, mounted the speaker in it. And my granddad got me some, um, some speaker uh, cover to go on the front. It was gold colored. I remember that I stained it and I did it in that little wood shop. So just to the left of that wood shop was where the, uh, the athletic field was. So at recess, you would stand out there to the left of the shop. And I can remember standing out there with Dwayne Elks. And Dwayne said, uh, I, I, it wasn't Dwayne. I was telling him about my necklace. Okay. And I told him, I said, now I've vowed that I'm going to wear this necklace every day. I'm not going to take it off for a year. And I remember he got that same look in his eyes, Trey. And he snatched that necklace off my neck and threw it. That's a fact. That happened. Oh my. <laughs> I, I knew he was going to do it when you said it. I said he snatched it off of you, didn't he? He did and threw it. So, and, so uh, this guy had some problem issues inside of him. Sadly, he did. He ended up committing suicide, sadly. Oh. 
um, years and years and years later. I didn't know him at the time. I had moved away. But he did commit suicide. But he had some um, always nice to me. And, I, you know, we were I considered as friends. But, man, you just never knew when he was going to do crazy stuff. You see him right now getting that glazed look and grabbing your necklace and snatching it off. Oh, him. it's it's crazy. I so, thank you. Do you remember? Like, well, uh, he was so crazy that you're not going to challenge him. Did you ever wear the necklace ever again? I, I don't remember. I I don't remember if I even found the necklace. I don't. I have no recollection of that. I just remember him snatching it off of me. Now something else that happened there, and this would be very very seventies, I think, was we would have um, at that same school we would have these, and we're going to run out of time. I think we're going to have to do two episodes yeah, because we're going to get into the eighties at some point. Yeah, and uh, so we're going to stay in the seventies right now. Yeah, and I'm always so, things too. So, um. We had a uh, an assembly in the gym. Okay. And I think from my memory, it was a dollar per person. All right. And we had a guy that brought whips. What? Whips. Okay. Yeah. And he had one that was as long as the gymnasium. And so it was like Wild Bill... Uh, with the whips and he did these whip demonstrations where he would take a whip. Literally it was as long as the gym floor and he could take it and knock stuff down with it. So I remember paying for that, for an assembly, this guy that came in there and did all these. Another thing that I remember at this same school, but it was not in the gymnasium. It was in the auditorium and this stuck with me the rest of my life. And I don't do drugs, never done drugs. I could have smoked a, a transfer truckload of marijuana for free. <laughs> All the music and bands I played in, I could have smoked so much of it. I just never, it never appealed to me. Yeah, yeah. And it may be because of this assembly that we had at this same school. Um, I could have snorted a line of cocaine from here to downtown Nashville for free. Wow. Okay. Because oh. all these bands, not all of them, but there was a lot of that kind of stuff around. Okay. So I remember this very specifically. This was definitely eighth grade. Uh, at Aiden Middle School in Aiden, North Carolina, we were in the auditorium and they had this, this thing where they were going to talk to us about drugs. Okay. One of the things that they told us in this assembly was that if you snorted cocaine, that it would cut a hole between your, your nose that you would have to have surgery to fix. It would actually bore a hole between your two, you know, the two different cavities. And the only way to fix it was they had to bust your nose with a brass hammer. This is what the guy said. I remember it just like it was yesterday. And cut your nose open and sew it all back up. But you couldn't have any anesthesia. And you couldn't have any painkillers. You had to do it awake. He went full blown on you kids. <laughs> he, he, said, he terrified me. He said, none and, of those kids going to be doing coke one day. And look, ever since then, I would never even consider it after I saw that. I haven't experienced Not even consider it. With something like a, a kick drugs show at a school. And yeah. I just remember vividly playing something on screen and seeing a girl that had taken the Oxycontin. Yeah. And, and they filmed her like her friends filmed her and like laughing at her and stuff. And she's on the bed out of it, foaming from the mouth. I've never forgotten that. and. Anytime something was like that, or if boom, I automatically thought of this girl on her bed, and I'm like, no way, uh, -uh. that's not, I don't do stuff like that. So you and, see, these drug things work. It works. You have a <laughs> in the '70s. I have it worked one. with me. It worked with you. So God bless them. I'm glad they're out there doing that. So another memory in Aiden. This would have been the ninth grade at Aiden High School, Aiden Grifton High School, which is out on the highway. In some of my videos, I actually take you there and show you that place. I remember a guy, the Cars had come out, the band, the Cars, during that time. I listened to Elvis. Really? Okay, during this time. So I was like, I don't want to listen to that. That rock and roll will rot your mind, you know? So I <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. You <laughs> it was the Cars. I can remember telling people, oh, yeah. At rock and, and roll. <laughs> yeah, that stuff's going to rot your mind. You can't listen to that. And um, so, uh, but at that time, I can remember a guy, I have no idea of his name. It was a black guy. And he could moonwalk. And he would moonwalk between every class. 
So no matter where he was at in the in the school, he moonwalked backwards to every class. <laughs> this dude just floating all day long. Just, yeah, yeah. just moonwalking everywhere. And um, just stuff like that that just sticks out to me. That, I mean, that's got to be 70s, right? That is 70s. has to be, right? If, if yeah. Remembering the bands and stuff. So that, that's a good question. I was, I'm, I asked you some questions. Yeah. All right. I'm going to open that door because now it's hot in here. So tell me Go this. Ahead. All right. So in the 70s, who who is the biggest singer in the 70s? For real. Who Who is who is the Elvis of the 70s or the, you know, was it Elvis? You know, it was bands. It was Led Zeppelin and uh, Leonard so Skinner. In the 70s, the bands have taken Elvis's place. They The bands have become the Elvis of music. I would say that that's accurate. Le Led Zeppelin. Uh, I can remember uh, somebody turning me on to Ted Nugent. The name of the album was Tight Spots. They, I got it from them on uh, eight track. Okay, there was a, a guy that was a little older than me that lived in the neighborhood uh, in Aden, and he turned me on to that. And I, I listened to that record and thought it was fantastic. And then just a couple of years later, that had to be. Uh, well, you know, maybe I was in the ninth grade at that time. It would have been close to the time. But what's funny is I was listening to Ted Nugent, but I thought the cars were going to rot your brain. You know what I'm saying? It's, it doesn't even make sense. So you're trying, I wonder why you thought that. There, you, you I don't know. I think, that you I think I was more leaning towards the rock and roll, the real true, what I would call real true rock and roll, where yeah. they were uh, more pop. You know what I'm saying? So I was kind of like, I don't know about this pop thing, which I like the cars. I think they're great. Well, how was Johnny Cash to you at this point? Was he uh, just an old country guy? Really? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. And my dad listened to country music, but Johnny Cash, we probably watched him on TV. I will say this that I kind of left out. And so this is very important. On Saturday nights, I'm going to say it was six o'clock. Uh, the opera came on the Grand Ole Opry, so that was a thing. It seemed like to me that the opera was on on two of the three channels. It was only three channels, and then you had UHF. You That's had the, the government channel on UHF. Um, but seemed like they were on two of the three channels. So on Saturday night, the opera was a go-to thing that you were going to watch every Saturday at six o'clock. Seemed like it was six to seven from my memory. Sunday night was going to be uh the uh magic i mean the uh wild kingdom and then disney and so the wild kingdom would have been sponsored by an insurance place from my memory and it was uh, marlon perkins and his sidekick jim and marlon would always send jim in to do dangerous stuff he would kind of stand by and let jim go do the dangerous stuff and uh, but it was uh, the Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim, and then seemed like maybe that came on at six o'clock, and at seven o'clock the Wonderful World of Disney came on. Wow. So that was that was must see TV on those two things. Now later in the seventies, um, must see TV would have been on Friday on Thursday night would have been Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days on. Friday night would have been um, the Love Boat from nine to ten and Fantasy Island from ten to eleven. Okay, Fantasy Pretty Island. Pretty sure that's correct. And now we're talking about not reruns. We're talking about yeah, they were out. Happy right. Days was in real time. At this that's time. right. And the way they did episodes back then, which is interesting, is they would have like twenty four episodes, and they would start on, let's say, the second week of January. And they would play through 24 episodes. They would take two weeks off and then they would start again, the same episode. So if you missed the one on the second week of January, you would watch it the second week of July. And then it would start again. So it'd be reruns. And what I'm saying may be completely off, for, but from my memory that I'm pretty sure that that's how it was. So yeah. if you knew, if you missed something, you could see it the next time around the second half. Yeah, I can't even imagine in a world with three stations. Well, the other thing that was that was a thing back then is uh, movies. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wizard of Oz, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Uh, Frosty the Snowman. 
Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Those kinds of things were one time a year. So yeah. like this Saturday night, Wizard of Oz. And then like two months later, they would advertise it. The the uh, Wizard of Oz. It was it's must see TV. Yeah, it's coming on at 8 p.m. Don't miss That's it. Right. Because you're not going to see it for another year and a half. <laughs> yeah, and another thing that we had during – um. This would have been ninth grade. So I would have been in, let's see, the ninth grade would have been 78, 79. We had Will C's Red Eye Cinema out of New Bern, North Carolina. I think that was channel, I think New Bern was channel seven. Uh, I think nine was Greenville, 12 was, uh, seven was New Bern, 12 was, not coming to me. Somebody else is, is yelling at the TV. Maybe 12 was Raleigh, but I don't think we got Raleigh from there. But anyway, on Will C's Red Eye Cinema, every Friday night, they would play three movies and they would be themed. So it may be Elvis. So it'd be three Elvis movies back to back, or it would be um, Westerns like uh, Rooster Cogburn and things like that, or it would be uh, army movies like Toro, Toro, Toro and the Sands of Iwo Jima. But it was always a thing. And what you could do is, and I would usually Friday night, I would stay up all night and watch those movies every time. If it was an Elvis thing, I would try to go to my friend Derwood Creech's house because they had a better TV than we did. <laughs> and I wanted all them to stay up and watch it with us. You know, he had sisters, he had a sister and a brother and a Howard. And we would all stay up and watch it and eat popcorn and just hang out all night and stay up all night. That's cool. And um, but you could call in, you could call in to Will C's Red Eye Cinema. And um Will C would have this thing where you could call in and and they would <laughs> they did different things. And from my memory, I'm gonna tell you a couple of different things. One is if you were caller number 12, you won a pizza. Okay, it would be something like that. Tied up, like so. Like sadly, sadly, we're running out of time. I didn't think we could talk this much about this, but I could go on for several whole decade. Yeah, and uh, so you're right; it's a whole decade. So one of the things that they did is they had this, and I don't think Will C did it, but I won pizzas by the way on the Will C Red Eye Cinema, right. and I mean I may have been the only one up watching <laughs> for. <Yeah, like, yeah. laughs> But I remember getting pizzas. You know, you would win a coupon and get a pizza. And yeah. um, we'll see. And we'll you'd see. also, they would do the monster stuff. So I would see Frankenstein, the real Frankenstein, and uh, the, uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Well, let me ask you this, because I just watched it for the first time the other night, because I've been wanting to watch it. Do you remember watching American Graffiti? I do, but that would have been in the 80s that I, or late 70s. I would have seen American Graffiti. Now, Ron Howard was in it. Ron Howard, yeah. Happy and days. Cindy. Uh, Cindy. Um, Guess who else is in it? Harrison Ford. Yeah. He was young. He was probably one of his first. I think it was his first role. I need to go back. Cindy Williams is in there from Laverne and Shirley. I do remember that. Cindy Williams was Ron Howard's girl in the A white T bird with a uh, the moon. The moon. Hey, all they did was cruise up and down. Yeah, street man, and all this stuff was happening. It was pretty yeah. cool. Like, if life was like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's fifties for sure. Yeah. So another thing that they did was, and I don't know that Will C ever did this, but I think it may have been this same radio or TV station. They would do this thing, and they called it POW, P O W. And you would call in, and the game was like um, asteroids, where they had a a spaceship that was pointed that would shoot. And the way they knew to shoot was you would call in on the phone and you would say, pow. And every time you would say, pow, somebody was there to hit a button. To <laughs> shoot. Pow, 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 pow. I'm not exact. That's a, that is a fact. Pow, 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 pow. And so and you could win stuff. Pow, somebody, there would be a sound effect of a gun going off. You know, they would shoot. Like they would have the icon on the TV screen and every time you'd say pow, somebody would push your button and it would shoot to rack up points to That's win. Great. Pow, pow, great. pow, pow, pow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, another thing, and so we, let's go back to Raleigh for just a second. Um, I was on the Uncle Paul show in Raleigh. Uh, so we had a local guy, the Uncle Paul, I remember he wore a top hat and glasses, and I thought he was famous. 
So I wanted to go be on the Uncle Paul show. So as a kid, I went to the Uncle Paul show. That was they had that in Memphis. You remember the guy that had the monkey that Elvis had scatter? Yeah. That guy had a TV show with the monkey. I didn't know that. But it was just a local TV show. Yeah. yeah. And so we had one in Raleigh called the Uncle Paul Show. And one last little thing that I wanted to before we uh close this one, we'll go to another one and I'll try to remember anything that I left out. Is when I was in the sixth grade. My school teacher, her name was Miss Best. I went to, uh, uh, this would have been Banks Elementary School in Kinston, North Carolina. And um, Miss Best, we had three classes. I remember changing classes. There was three rooms and you would just move from room to room to room. And I went recently and filmed at this school. But this lady, um, she lived in Grifton, North Carolina, from my memory. And they owned a, um, a company that did um uh clay clay's not the right word uh um what would it be it's they did cats with with real looking eyes and they would stick them in an oven and bake them so you could paint them they would put this stuff on them yeah uh, it's um pottery it's like pottery yeah, yeah. yeah so it's like pottery, but she had, and I was always just fascinated by these cats. And uh, in fact, what's interesting is during that time, my wife would have been in the fifth grade at the same school, but I never knew her, but I knew her cousin at the time. Oh, uh, okay. I thought her cousin was very pretty. <laughs> and uh, so I can remember being there at that school. And uh, I got, I actually have a scar on my face and I'm friends with Juan Bolden even today. I was uh, a guy there, a black guy named Juan Bolden. And Juan, we were playing dodgeball and he was running and had his mouth open when he was running and ran into me and his bottom teeth knocked me out and cut me right there. And I had to go get stitches. That's why I have a scar right there today. Wow. That happened at Banks Elementary School. Juan Bolden. Yep. And like I say, I'm still friends with Ron, Juan today. He still lives in Kinston. Wow, Billy. Or Facebook friend. Yeah. Well, when y'all used to, when you when you would go out to eat back then, what was what were restaurants like? I mean, Trey? Did you diners? Did you? You didn't, you didn't go, out, go out to eat. Wow. And I shouldn't say that. I mean, Kentucky it was fried a, chicken. It was a Kentucky special fried case. chicken. That would be it. Kentucky fried chicken. Kentucky fried chicken. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I hated it. The chicken on the bone was a no-go for me, but I would eat the uh, the mashed potatoes and gravy. And the mashed potatoes and gravy still taste today just like they tasted back then. And my grandma and granddaddy, uh, as a kid, another little 70s thing. We're going to have to do another one and stay in the 70s. Yeah, let's just do um, part two of this at some yeah, point. And uh, so we'll do that because there's so much more to tell. My I grandma and granddaddy do what? I have a lot of questions to ask you about. Okay. My grandma and granddaddy. So we'll do part two of the seventies friends. So I'll tell this and then we'll, we'll depart and start again. So my grandma and granddaddy would keep these uh, wipes that came from Kentucky fried chicken. They were that, they, that big, you tear them open and it was like a wet wipe and they would wash my face with it as a kid. And they kept them in their glove box in their station wagon. They had a 72 model Caprice estate classic Chevrolet station wagon blue. And I can still remember them opening that glove box and tearing those things and washing my face with it. And it had a very specific smell. And I'll leave y'all with that because any of y'all that grew up in the 70s that went to Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know the smell I'm talking about. So put it down in the comments if you remember that smell. It's very, very specific. And it, isn't it funny how I can remember smells and just little things from that time period that things that just stick out to me so much that if I smelled it again, I go, yep, that's wet wipes from, from Kentucky fried chicken. It actually had KFC Kentucky fried chicken. It was back when it was Kentucky fried chicken, not KFC. And it actually was on the wet wipe. So they would go and eat there and keep them in the car. But it wasn't until the late seventies that, uh, that we ate. I can remember eating, uh, I'm going to say 70. It was after we lived in Aden, we would go to Greenville to the, to the, um, it was called Bonanza. And my mama told me recently, we talked about it at Christmas, that I wanted to get uh, bacon bits on my salad to tell you how poor we were. And we were not the only ones. 
I wanted to get bacon bits to go on my salad there and we couldn't afford them sometimes. So they, I think they were a quarter or 50 cent. And there was times when she'd have to say, no, we can't afford that this time. Wow. Really? So I'll leave y'all with that. So we're very, very, very fortunate in this country. And I would say around the world, our poor people have big screen TVs and SUVs <laughs> and they're not ever having a day where they can't have bacon bits. I can remember not being able to afford bacon bits. That's a fact. That's and cool. I've, I've worked my butt off. So that doesn't happen to my kids. And I'm thankful to God every day for the opportunities that he gave us, me and you, and the opportunity to do a podcast and tell things like this. So we ran a little bit over. Let's go to part two. Stay tuned. It'll be next week, friends. It's not going to come right away. I know y'all expect everything just right away. That's why you have to subscribe here on That's YouTube right. or wherever you're listening at. That's right. If you're not subscribed, make sure you subscribe because we want to tell you the rest of the story. Tighten up. Don't double dribble. <laughs>